and thank you, the organisers, for the great honour of inviting me here. And it's a real pleasure for me to be here with you for the first time. And I can't thank you ladies uh, sufficiently for for looking after me so well and just being so generally helpful and charming. <coughs> so, <coughs> um, it might not have been obviously clear from the the main title that what I meant by the, two, the tale of two Louis was Louis Pasteur and Louis Stevenson. Now, I'm not sure that these two have ever been put together on the same page before, and if I'm wrong, I'd love to know who did it before me. <laughs> anyway, to begin to explain, I ought to explain briefly that I've brought Stevenson and Pasteur together because, well, for several reasons, it, it's an improbable pairing, I should think you would say. Apart from both being named Louis, what else is there that they could have in common? <laughs> the answer that I set out here is quite a lot, actually. Not merely that they crossed paths in the Cévennes, which they did, nor that they both overcame daunting challenges while they were there, which is true, but that they also triumphed and emerged as pioneers, each in their own separate way. This whole concept was triggered by a personal coincidence of mine, in which I came uh, in search of a résidence secondaire to the southwest of France. I had no special interest or desire to end up in the Cévennes or anywhere else particularly. I didn't have either Pasteur or Stevenson in mind when I, when I started out, but that's where I ended up. And slightly, a little time later, I discovered, oh, is that so? I was only an hour's drive from the end of the Stevenson Trail in the Cévennes. I thought, oh, that's interesting, and thought no more about it. And then it occurred to me that the small property in which I, which I had acquired and, and which I now still live <coughs> was in fact a converted 19th century silk factory that had closed down owing to circumstances which I'm going to explain. And uh, nevertheless, its closure owed its continued existence for some time in a large degree to Louis Pasteur. So these connections began to form in my mind and I thought, oh, what can I do with this? Um, it's true that I had been long interested uh, in Stevenson's life and work. It's also true that the Cévennes had uh, always attracted me as a, well, somewhere I might like to visit or even live um, because of their beauty and their ruggedness and their Scottishness to some degree, um, and I knew that uh, in be beyond that, I knew that Pasteur was one of its many legends, and partly because of this connection with me writing or conducting or organising seminars on the health of the history of health at the World Health Organisation. Um, anyway, I knew Pasteur was one of the many legends of the Cévennes. He was the man who saved the French silk industry from a ruinous epidemic. So it intrigued me that they might have come together, or although they were there for different reasons, they might just have crossed paths. Stevenson went there as a solitary adventurer for his own pleasure, and the, sheer, the sheer joy of discovering yet more unknown landscapes, flora and fauna. He was determined to write a book about his adventures a book that would go further than his striking essay of The Enjoyment of Unpleasant Places, published when he was just 24 years old, and that this book would do better than his first and only other book, An Inland Voyage, published just a year before he set out on his latest adventure. He hoped so anyway, and he went off with a spring in his step. Pastor, on the other hand, went off dragging his feet. He was, um, <coughs> he was dispatched 
with little notice from Paris by the French Ministry of Agriculture, with whom he had some links, uh, to this event. There was little pleasure in his mission and little respite either. On and off, sometimes for months at a time, Pasteur, Pasteur's time in this event spanned five years. It can truly be said that both Stevenson and Pasteur, at least at first, got completely lost. Completely lost in this event. Uh, first of all, Stevenson, with uh, his hapless and unhelpful donkey, made many a wrong turn, followed numerous false trails, went round and round in circles, became fed up and found himself <coughs> back where he started. So figuratively did Pasteur. Peering down his microscope in the makeshift laboratory he'd established deep in the same hills. He preferred to work alone and he failed pre frequently to see where he was going wrong, conducting futile experiments and coming up time and again with the wrong answers. He too had to start again. Well, ultimately, of course, both men succeeded against the odds as our heroes should do. Despite all the setbacks, their reputations were ultimately greatly enhanced by their exploits in this event. Stevenson earned the accolade of pioneer because his book opened the door to a new fashion in France and elsewhere that persists to this day. He was, without realising it perhaps, a trailblazer of walking tours, of trekking, of, or of rambling. He was the first of the great rondonneur. And for that alone, France, I think, f remains touchingly very fond of him, especially in the Cévennes. No end of people followed literally in his footsteps, and still do. Many wanted, and still want, to experience <coughs> the same sort of almost spiritual tranquillity under the stars that he described so beautifully in Travels with a Donkey, particularly in the chapter A Night Among the Pines. In his much longer life, Pasteur graduated from a rather humble industrial chemist to become world famous in medical science, a developer of human and animal vac <coughs> vaccines, and a founder of what was then the new science of microbiology. In trying to put this tale of two Louis together, I discovered to my surprise that there was much else to link the two men, and closer connections than I could have imagined, and some of them were frankly bizarre. <coughs> For example, what did Stevenson have to do with Queen Victoria, or her Lady of the Bedchamber, <coughs> or with Her Majesty's personal surgery? Nothing at all, on the face of it. <laughs> on the face of it, nothing at all, except that in their service to the Queen, Lady Joy Jane Churchill, born an aristocrat <coughs> in her own right, and Professor Joseph Lister, appointed by the Queen as her surgeon in ordinary, came to know each other quite well. This, that would have counted for very little had they not both also come to know the man who is the vital link in this whole story. None other than William Ernest Henley. <coughs> Henley, excuse me. Henley would become Stevenson's great friend and literary collaborator for many years. But Stevenson and Henley would never have met without the collusion of these two members of the royal entourage. How Lady Churchill met Henley in the first place and the nature of her relationship with the larger-than-life amateur poet, 23 years her junior, are unknown. She left no memoirs or correspondence because Victoria forbade such indiscretions, and Henley never alluded to her, as far as I know. But she had certainly taken pit pity on him because he, Henley, had already lost the lower part of one leg through bone cancer in his youth, and now, aged just 24, he was terrified of losing the other one. <coughs> Henley also was keenly aware of Lister's growing reputation as a radical surgeon uh, at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. He also knew Lady Churchill and Lister knew each other. Henley was so desperate to become Lister's patient that in early 1873 he wrote to her, begging for an introduction. 
and she fixed it. <coughs> Excuse me. She fixed it. She forwarded Henley's letter directly to Lister. Within a week, Henley was installed <coughs> in Lister's ward, <coughs> Reserve Ward B in Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, as his patient. It was a spectacular example of spectacular example of queue jumping of the most privileged level. When her intervention became real, became known, it raised eyebrows and uh, over royal etiquette and ethics. Even Lister's wife Agnes commented on it in a letter she wrote confidentially to a close friend uh, on July 18, 1873, in which she adds sardonically, "What would the London surgeons say?" <coughs> <coughs> but given Lady Churchill's reputation, Lister could hardly refuse. He confirmed his willingness to oblige, pledging that he would treat Henley under my care with no expense incurred. And he kept his word. Lady Churchill has been described as undoubtedly the most powerful and influential of all the Queen's female appointees. She would be Victoria's constant companion for almost 50 years. Lister operated on Henley twice in 1873 and kept him as his patient for two more years. For most of that time, Henley was confined to his hospital bed in considerable pain, and in his darkest hours, his only comforts were the poems he wrote and the morale-boosting visits by Stevenson and a few others. Stevenson first visited him at the urging of their mutual friend, Leslie Stephen, editor of the Edinburgh literary journal, The Cornhill. They stuck up an instant bond in that gloomy ward, <coughs> and uh, Stevenson became a regular visitor. He organised Henley's rare trips out of hospital, with horse and carriage waiting at the steps, and young Louis serving as his unlikely physical crutch. There can be no doubt that Lister saved Henley, or that Stevenson made Henley. He ensured <coughs> Henley's unique poems were burnished, revised, edited, and published in the Cornhill. They shared many more literary efforts in both poetry and prose in the coming years. They co-wrote and published three plays, of which Deacon Brodie was the most successful. Lister had no time for poetry, and there was little pleasure in his life in any direction. He had seen for himself that far too many of his patients and it was true generally in other hospitals, died post-operatively. The wounds became infected and gangrenous. However, as Henley, Henley most likely told Stevenson, Lister was introducing the controversial use of carbolic acid as a disinfectant, either used directly on surgical bandages or sprayed in operating theatres or in the vicinity of patients under his care. The most eminent of these was Queen Victoria. <coughs> in 1871, he operated on her at Balmoral Castle in the Scottish Highlands to, re to remove a big and possibly malignant growth in her armpit. She was under chloroform and the watchful eye of Lady Churchill, <coughs> but the carbolic spray stung her eyes and gave her a skin rash. She was not amused, <coughs> but she was cured. And a few years later, she rewarded Lister, elevating him to the title of Baron Lister. By then, he, Lister, had reduced mortality among his surgical patients from 45 to 15 percent. Lister may have saved Victoria's life as well as Henley's. One can reasonably assume that Stevenson met Lister during their frequent, his frequent times in Henley's ward, and whatever his impressions, there's no doubt of Henley's rapturous regard of Lister the greatest surgeon in the world. And what did Pastor have to do with all of this? <laughs> <laughs> On the face of it, again, nothing at all. <laughs> except, except that crucially, Pastor deeply influenced Lister's study of human disease and thence his obsessive aseptic hospital work. Lister was an enthusiastic supporter of Pastor's radical suggestions on germ theory, which simply stated, accept that many human diseases do not originate in the human spontaneously in the human body, but 
as was a conventional assumption, they were caused by invasive germs, microorganisms flourishing in the everyday environment, give them another shorter name, microbes. And you then begin to see how Pasteur and Lister created the new science of microbiology. And just as was the case <coughs> with Stevenson and Henley, so there then began a long collaboration between Pasteur and Lister. They were two of a kind, the two pairs of them. In June 78, 1878, only months before RLS um, set out for this event, the two scientists and their wives dined and lunched together in Paris. Then and thereafter, they backed each other against the bitter hostility that both suffered from their professional peers. Much more significantly, they advanced new understandings of microbiology. These two would change the direction of medicine and public health forever. From 1864 to 1896, Lister advocated Pasteur's work uh, in British medical journals and in turn Pasteur promoted Lister's own uh, approaches. When Pasteur died, Lister paid a fulsome tribute to him in 1895 and you can find an obituary by uh, Lister in the London Times of that time. <coughs> Stevenson's own tribute to Henley is in its own way equally memorable. As he freely acknowledged, and we all probably know, Henley with his roguish charm and wooden crutch was his inspiration for Long John Silver in Treasure Island. He also recognised the talent that, uh, that um, <coughs> Henley revealed in his sombre hospital poems. Best known among those verses and indicative of his spirit are Henley's verses in the poem Invictus, which I'll try to read for you if you like. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of this shade, <clears throat> and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. You cannot look at either Stevenson or Pasteur for very long without realising that these inspirational lines can be easily applied to them both. We can detect similar degrees of self-belief, refusal to give in or give up, and the drive to succeed. But there is something more to add. Stevenson and Pasteur were both blighted by poor health, which eventually killed them. We all know Stevenson was a sickly little boy who might well have died in childhood. For the rest of his life, he suffered from incurable tuberculosis. In midlife, Pasteur, who was 28 years older than Stevenson, was cut down by a devastating stroke that left him gravely paralysed for more than a year, unable to work, write or even speak. He slowly recovered but was still handicapped when he corresponded with Lister for the first time in 1874. He described the stroke he had suffered and apologised for keeping his letter short because he explained, writing at any length exhausts me. Even then, pleasure had largely eluded Pasteur. He and his wife lost three of their four daughters to childhood diseases. Only one, Zizi, the oldest, who he adored, and his only son, for whom, from whom he was often estranged, survived into adulthood. Exhaustion was the undoing of Stevenson too. He often worked under what until he collapsed. Both men put themselves under intolerable pressures that inevitably killed them both. Stevenson was finished off by a sudden stroke while writing the unfinished Weir of Hermiston. So it was with Pasteur. His next stroke killed him. Each in his own way, for better or worse, was truly master of his fate and captain of his soul. And they had <coughs> surprise, <coughs> excuse me, surprisingly similar thoughts or philosophies. The more I study nature, the more I stand amazed at the work of the Creator, <coughs> Pastor famously observed. And Stevenson would write in travels 
I have not often enjoyed a more serene possession of myself, nor more in independent of materials, uh, uh, nor more independent of materials. The outer world from which we cower into our houses seemed, after all, a gentle, habitable place, and night after night, a man's bed, it seemed, was laid in waiting for him in the fields where God keeps an open house. Two minutes, please. Two minutes. Two minutes. It's her. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. Okay, sorry. Um, all right. Okay, last, last, I'll skip a bit, and I'll, uh, one more quote from Pastor, which I actually think is um, very much a historical truth. Micro, mesure, he said, mesure, c'est le microbe qui auront le dernier mot. They surely had the last word with Stevenson. And who can doubt their warning today in this pandemic world where most antibiotics have become almost useless? The only place I know where you can find Pastor and Stevenson under the same roof is in an elegant building called the Maison Rouge in saint jean de Gard. It used to be a silk factory and now it's a museum. There is a selection of um, Pastor's work and a little corner devoted to Stevenson and his travels. And that saint jean de Gard is the final point of the, the um, Stevenson trial. So I'll skip a, a little of the background history about the silk epidemic, and I'll get to the point where once you've been to the Maison Rouge and once you're coming out, um, you'll find there's a, an old public water fountain with a pretty little mosaic tableau of Stevenson and uh, Modestine and a plaque commemorating the passage, their passage through the town. The town also has a nice little bookshop in which French translations of Travels with a Donkey are always displayed, along with other Stevenson's books and souvenirs and memorabilia. So, if you ask for directions for it, somebody will tell you, oh, that's easy. All you do is go past the Fontaine Stevenson and just off the Rue Pasteur, you'll find it. Voila. <laughs> Thank you.